Welcome back, all you unsupervised children that got lost in Mount Moon, to another episode of Video Game World Tours, a series where we slow down and soak in a game's environment. Today's tour takes us to the world of Pokemon Red as we explore the Kanto region. Your journey as a Pokemon trainer begins in Pallet Town. I honestly struggle to think of a more iconic first town in an RPG. After all, this is not only the first town in a very popular game, it's the first town in the first game of a very popular series. So many future starting areas in Pokemon games took inspiration from Pallet Town. And it's easy to see why. This town is just so efficiently built. There's Red's house, Professor Oak's lab, and the rival's house. That's it. No other buildings. Where does this guy live? Or this girl? Or any of the workers in Oak's lab? I won't harp on the game too much for that. That's a thing in pretty much every older RPG. It just kind of gives Pallet Town some character. There's no extraneous buildings here. Every building has a purpose. Even in the rival's house, if you talk to his mom, she'll give you a town map. I was initially going to call this place enclosed, because it really does feel compact. There's not a lot of wasted space. But even outside of the physical space, just emotionally, it feels closed off. Looking to the edge of town, though, there's grass surrounding you on pretty much all sides. I would have expected to be surrounded by trees or something. That feels more natural. Sure enough, in Pokemon Fire Red, trees line the edge of town. Maybe I was mixing those two versions up in my mind, but they kind of create a different vibe. It's either a town tucked away behind some trees, hidden from the rest of civilization, or a town in the middle of an empty field. I guess both are isolating, in a way. Before we move on, I want to visit Red's bedroom real quick. I never really felt an inclination to come back here after starting the journey, so it's weird to return after so long. It's pretty big, but there's not a lot decorating it. Some stuff along the walls, and a TV on the floor in the middle. With a Super Nintendo, of course. But what else could a kid need? In perhaps the most unrealistic part of this adventure, the child abandons their SNES and journeys outside. And just a heads up, I'm not going to cover every single location in the game. I'm just going to talk about the areas I thought were interesting in one way or another. But we're still going to see a lot of places, so strap in. Not too far away from Pallet Town is Viridian City. I like the scale increase here. It's just a little bit bigger than Pallet to make you feel like you've truly left home. There's a Pokemon Center, a shop, and a gym, but there's still only two houses. It's not completely overwhelming you with a massive metropolis immediately after leaving home. It's kind of relatable being on the outskirts of a bigger city and having to travel into it for groceries or something. It's not out of the question that maybe Red has been here a couple times with his mom for food. He might be venturing just a little bit out of his comfort zone here by coming to Viridian City by himself. Thankfully, now areas start to get big enough where he can find some weird spots. First of all, here's the gym for the city. You can't enter just yet, but considering this is the first time you see one, it leaves an impression. It's the same size as Oak's lab, so it feels equally as important. And all this open space in the northwest corner kinda emphasizes that. Like you get to walk around the gym and just kinda feel how big it is. It's much more impactful than if it was tucked right against the corner here. Another interesting spot in the town is right here. It's the first time in the game where you see a cuttable tree, and it jumps out to you as something you'll probably be able to interact with later. Both because it has a different texture than all the other trees, and the fact that you can see a path behind it. Eventually, you can return to this town after getting cut. It's been a while since I played this game, so I wanted to see what was behind this tree. I made the journey all the way back here and cut it with my trusty Oddish. Ah, I see, it's a longer path than I was expecting. Surely this will lead to something good. Hmm, big area. A lot of different ways I could go. I'll just see what's down here. I'm back in town. What was the point of that? You enter town, take a left, 
go up this path and hit a dead end. Or you could enter town, walk straight up, and be on the other side of that dead end. Am I missing something? Apparently there's a hidden item where the cuttable tree is, but this spot feels too weird to be just for that. Cut is also usable on this tree. An NPC is in here, and talking to him will give you the TM for Dream Eater. But how did he get here? If you don't use Cut, he's completely locked away in this prison. You can only jump down from these cliffs. Maybe he surfed over there? Alright, that's enough Viridian City for now. We'll return here much later. Cutting through the maze-like Viridian Forest is a bit of a chore if you don't know the right way to go. There's a lot of dead ends and loops that make it kinda awkward. I can imagine an actual 11-year-old getting lost in here and ganged up on by all the bug Pokémon. Pewter City is one of those places where you can just rush to the gym, beat the leader, and head off to the next town. But I think the city itself is kinda interesting. For example, this little spot. It's a garden. Like, an actual garden. This guy sprays Repel to keep Pokémon away from it. There's a lot of little parts of this world here that are cordoned off like this, and they have no real contextual reason for existing. But this is some guy's garden. This is just a little space next to the Pewter Museum of Science. It has some flowers, I guess, but it's weirdly out of the way. And why does this path continue up this cliffside? Why isn't this whole thing just a garden? Since we're so close to the museum, we might as well check it out. I think it's funny that entry costs 50 Poké Dollars. That's pretty much nothing considering how much you'll get from battling, but they still wanted you to have to pay some amount to enter. There's no gameplay reason to pay that fee and come in here. You just learn a tiny bit of actual history. Which I think is kinda cute. Give kids a little space to learn some real history in their fun pet battling simulator. Hanging out in the museum is alright. Okay, moving on from Pewter City, you arrive at the foot of Mount Moon. It's interesting how they indicate the gradual rising of elevation with all these little cliffsides. That's really the only way they can convey that. It's a big chunk of empty space here, too. Got a little Pokémon Center right at the entrance so you can come back and heal. You don't really get to feel how big or tall Mount Moon is because of the limitations of the Game Boy. Like, it's a mountain. I bet it's massive. But all you get to see of that is this tiny entrance and the pathway leading up to it. I guess they did a good job at making you feel like it's really big by priming you like that. Well, that plus the interior. This is an actual nightmare to get through. Unlike Viridian Forest, where there are some safe tiles, every single tile in Mount Moon has a chance for a random encounter, and you'll be doing a lot of walking to try and find the right path. But I already did that once, and I don't want to spend any more time in here, so let's magically appear at the exit. Exiting Mount Moon leads you to Route 4. It's an exceedingly plain route, perhaps even more plain than Route 1, the first one you come across. There are literally no trainers to fight, and you don't even have to risk a wild encounter on your way to the next town if you don't want to. Though I guess that's nice considering the gauntlet you just went through. Those Zubats probably beat you senseless, and the developers didn't want to put any more pressure on you before you could hit the next Pokémon Center. But yeah, it's pretty empty around here. I've been walking around and, as you can see, it's just ledges. So, excited to finally reach the next town and heal up, you get ready to jump off this ledge. After all, it's an action you've done throughout the game. What's the worst that could happen? Little did you know what consequences your actions would have. What diabolical situation you would find yourself in. The moment you jump off this ledge, you can't go back. The only parts of this route you have access to from down here is this path and this patch of grass. There is no opening that lets you back up where you could re-enter Mount Moon and go all the way back to Pallet Town. You have crossed the point of no return. Okay, it's not that big of a deal. Once you defeat two more gyms, you gain access to Cut, which lets you go back. But it kind of feels like a big deal in the moment. I don't know why I'd want to go back to Pewter or whatever this early, but the fact that they won't let me makes me want to all the more. 
I feel like a caged animal sitting here at the eastern edge of Route 4. So close to freedom. It's just over that ledge. If only I could slip past. But you can't. Not right now, at least. For the time being, I guess we can explore the rest of our cell. Cerulean City. Cerulean feels a bit more playful than pewter. Whether it's the music, the layout, or the gym's focus on water over rock, I can't say for sure, but this feels like more of a fun place to be. Unfortunately, there's not as many interesting spots. Though when I was looking around for something to talk about, I saw that there's a little fenced-off area behind these two houses. I thought it was cute that they had a backyard, so I went inside the house to see what it was like. Just some big guy with no shirt and a receding hairline sitting at a table. That's all this place has. I don't know why I say he has no shirt. It's hard to explain, but he kinda has vibes like this. No shade to him, he's probably super chill. But his place is... Oh, there's a back door. You actually do get to explore his backyard. I say explore, there's not much exploring to be had. But it's cool to walk around here at all. But what about this building? I didn't bring it up in the other cities, but there are a lot of these in the game. Buildings with walls, roofs, and windows, but no door. There's a handful in Cerulean here, and it's kind of when I started to notice it. I guess it makes sense that they'd want more buildings to fill up the town space, but not want to have a billion interiors for the player to enter and get distracted with. There are some houses you come across that are just for flavor, like there's no items or trades in there. But a lot of the time, you're rewarded for your curiosity, even if it is just a tip or hint. So whether it was a time or size constraint, or they just didn't want to overwhelm the player with a bunch of buildings that mean nothing, I get it. For some reason, I remember this lady. She's standing out in front of a nameless building with her Slowbro, trying to get it to use a certain move. Though Slowbro seems to march to the beat of his own drum, Interestingly, the move she asks it to do changes whenever you talk to her again. And the Slowbro has a few different disrespectful actions he can do as well. Cute, and not something you'd notice if you only talk to them once. This part I knew I had to show off in the video. At the western edge of the city, you can see a guy guarding a cave entrance. But why does he look kinda... I remember seeing so many people say that they thought this guy was a British royal guard. The entrance to the cave looks like his super tall hat. Even obviously that that's not what it is, it's hard to not see it when I look at him. Just one weird British cultural thing transported into the fictional world of Pokemon. And if you didn't see it before, now you do. You're welcome. To the north is Nugget Bridge. After fighting a good amount of trainers there and throughout Route 25, you arrive at Bill's house. Bill definitely has secluded mad scientist vibes, especially considering you first find him transformed into a Pokemon via an experiment straight out of the fly. And that's the only experiment that we do see. Who knows what other crazy stuff he gets up to way up here by himself. This is actually the furthest up north you can reach on the map. And it's interesting that it's just a dead end. You don't see many natural dead ends in Kanto, as the map loops around pretty well. But this is one of the spots where you truly do reach a wall and have to just turn around. Though if you look behind his house, it looks like there's a path back there. This is as far as you can scroll up without entering the house. But if you do, the screen scrolls up for a brief moment. You can see that a cliff cuts off the path. Though considering the cliff doesn't have the natural cliffside you see along here, I'm almost tempted to say they didn't think you'd even notice this. And most people probably didn't, so it's fine. He also has these little pools of water in front of his house, with a bridge reaching over it. Kind of a cute little front yard, if you ask me. I might even call it the most chill place in the game. But there's still a lot of Kanto to see, so I'll bite my tongue for now. Leaving Bill's house in Cerulean City, you have to take the underground path to reach the next town. Underground path is an apt description for this place. It's underground, and it's a path. Nothing more, nothing less. No trainers, no items, just nothing. This path is just 10 or so seconds of straight up walking. I feel like if I were designing a place like this in a game, 
I'd try to throw something in here to make it more interesting. Some signs, some NPCs talking to each other, anything just to give it a bit of flavor. But this is as plain as it gets. It's surprisingly real in a way. Sometimes in real life, you come across bland or boring areas. It's neat to find something like this in a video game every now and then. After the long and arduous 10 second trek through the underground path, you reach the surface. And not long after that, you reach Vermilion City. Kinda like Cerulean, it has some water vibes going on, even though the gym here is electric based. Something that sticks out to me is that there's not a lot of greenery around here. Where in other towns you'd see patches of grass or flowers, there's practically none here. The only bit of floor in this town is this 2x2 two two square. The rest of the ground in town is this paved path texture. Or maybe it's supposed to be sand because it's at a coast? Not sure. An interesting spot here is this plot of land. Some guy is having his machop walk around and flatten the land to eventually erect a building on. I think it's interesting that this is a building in development and it never gets finished. I feel like later Pokemon games have conditioned me to think that when I see something like this, I'll be able to come back later and see the completed product. Maybe after defeating the Elite Four, the guy finishes his building and you can come by for a challenge. But no, the building never gets built. This Machop truly is the Sisyphus of the Pokemon world. The Pokemon Fan Club is on the western side of town. This is where you get the Bike Voucher, a very nice item to get. But I also just kinda think that this building is funny. Like people joined this club to talk about how much they love Pokemon. It'd be like if someone started a dog fan club and they met every week to talk about how much they loved dogs. Though I'm sure that's probably already a thing. It's cute how the Pokemon here get seats alongside their owners. This guy has a Pikachu out. I swore I talked to him once and he commented on the fact that I had a Pikachu in my party too. He said something like, my Pikachu is cuter than yours. I can't get him to say it again though. This lady has a seal. Isn't that the same sprite you see when you're surfing? She has a surfing seal sitting on this chair. Seals are cute, so I'll let it pass. Okay. That's enough of Vermilion. The final stop of the tour is a spot that's a bit more obscure, the SS Ann. Well, I say obscure. This is a place you have to visit during the main story progression. It's obscure in the fact that once you help the captain of the boat, the boat sets sail and you never see it again. I brought this up way back in my Sonic Adventure tour, but I always find myself drawn to areas in games where you can only visit them for a short period of time. There's a lot of places in this game where you'll probably only go there once yourself, like who's going back to Bill's Sea Cottage? But the point is, you can. You can walk north of Cerulean and go talk to him again whenever you want. You cannot return to the SSAN once you leave. So let's enjoy it while we can. What does this boat have in store for us? The SSAN's defining feature is all the guest rooms you can enter. If you want to rush right to the rival fight, you can do that without any extraneous trainer battles. But you're missing so much if you do. Rooms to explore, items to find, people to talk to. So many little spaces that you can so easily skip over. There are 16 guest rooms you can enter. Not all of them have battles, but I'm pretty sure all of them will have at least one NPC to talk to. Kinda like the underground path, this sells the world as real to me. Obviously, a real cruise ship would probably have more than 16 rooms, but as it is in this game world, 16 feels massive. I can easily imagine another RPG out there having a similar location, but only four rooms. The scale kinda helps with that as well as some of the other rooms you come across. Like you can visit the front deck. You won't find anything of importance here other than some battles, but I like that you can come out here at all. I've never been on a cruise, but I imagine it'd be nice to get some fresh air after being in the cramped hallways for a bit. I kind of feel that here. The kitchen is another perfectly normal room, except there's no trainers to fight in here. Just a place where food is prepared for all the people aboard. There are a fair amount of chefs to talk to, though. 
you get to see an amazing accent from this guy. An odd ball in the trash, you say? Huh. Neat. Finally, the captain's room. He's a guy having some problems with seasickness. You can tell by his dialogue, but he's also reading a book to give him tips on how to deal with it. You can also look in the trash can, he was... yeah. With a pat on the back, and a captain that's feeling better, we disembark the SS Anne. Our journey into the Kanto region continues. But not today. I wanted to give the locations in this game the time they deserved, so I'm splitting this into two parts. I don't have an idea of when part two will be coming out, but by god I will return to Kanto and finish this tour someday. Get subscribed to see it whenever it happens. Check out either of these videos, like this video, leave a comment, insert other calls to action here. Thanks for watching and see you next time.